On this episode of The Paul Report, we switch gears and talk more about hooves. Horses can be used for so many different things, work around the farm, racing, riding, even therapy. Horse enthusiast, owner, and volunteer at the Paradise Equestrian Therapy Center in Charleston, Carol Gailey joins us to explain why the term workhorse is fitting for this large animal. Stay with us. Production for the Paul Report is made possible by Inyert Tire and Auto Center in Charleston and Mattoon. Inyert offers complete auto repair. Inyert Tire and Auto Center cares about our community and thanks you for being a responsible pet owner. More information at Inyert.com. And we are joined by a special guest today. She is a lifelong horse owner, enthusiast, and she's also a volunteer at the Paradise Equestrian Therapy Center in Charleston. And we'll talk more about that in the interview. We thank Carol Gailey for joining us on this episode of The Paw Report. And today we're gonna talk about horses and their vast, vast versatility because horses can be used for so many different things. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this episode. As I mentioned, you're a lifelong horse owner and lover. What, what drew you to this animal? Just total fascination with, with them and what they do. And um, they're fun to work with. They're, it's very calming to spend time with them. You go, you've had a bad day at work and you go out to the barn and, and um, they love to be brushed and petted and talked to. And if I'm having a bad day, you know, you can sort of tell them about it and they don't care as long as you're just spending time with them. So they're just, there's just something just super special about them. Before we launch into the different, um, different jobs, if you will, of, of horses, mm -hmm. uh, somebody that owns a horse, that's, that's quite an undertaking. Um, and you've been doing it uh, virtually your whole life. So somebody out there that's not a horse owner, maybe talk about that experience and what a commitment it is to, to take on uh, those animals. It's a huge commitment. Um, I, I don't like to discourage people because we want to perpetuate people having horses and enjoying them, but you need to look at it at the expense and do some research as to um, what you're going to do with that horse. They have to be fed every day, they can, and of course they have the manure factor that has to be taken care of. You can't just let it pile up, mm -hmm. um, and they have, have to have uh, yearly vet care just like a, a dog or cat. Um, they have to have their feet trimmed, they have to have their teeth worked on. So there's a lot invested, in, um, and it's a huge time investment and it's a big money investment because you have to have hay and sometimes that can be difficult to get a hold of mm -hmm. um, and you have to have your sources. So you have to be on top of it all the time. Horses and ponies can be used for, and you have both, they can be used for, for so many different things. Specifically, um, in your life, what, what do you use your um, horses and ponies for? My horses, I'm strictly a trail rider. I, I love the peace of being out in the woods and being in nature, uh, just ambling down the trail, if you will. Um, and the, 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 just the peace that you get from that. Um, my ponies I bought for my granddaughters to ride and one pulls a cart. So uh, we do a little bit of everything with them. I've started taking them out uh, for people. I took them to the WIU Kids Day last September and uh, was amazed that people stood in line for two hours to, to get to be able to pet or, or brush one of the ponies. They were fascinated and they were so happy. It just never occurred to me that people don't have access to horses like they used to. And when I was a kid, I could go anywhere you know, and pet a, uh, pet a horse or see a horse. You can't do that anymore. So um, that kind of gave me the idea then that I make mine more accessible. So I'm taking them out more in public and to different venues. Um, and we ha I take them to pet. Uh, for different activities that we have out there just so that people can um, be around them and see what they're like and to pet them and, and just see what wonderful animals they are. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, different breeds are, are used for different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you, you definitely wouldn't you know, put a Shetland pony into the Kentucky Derby. I mean, those are thoroughbreds and, mm -hmm. and the horses that are built for racing. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other breeds used for? 
Okay, for instance, the quarter horses are used a lot for ranch work, working cows. They, they have an, a, bred with an innate sense of watching a cow and, and you'll see competitions where they'll um, hook onto a cow and they'll follow its movement and block it and then they'll sort it and make it move to a certain area. Um, it, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, watch them do that. Um, Appaloosas have similar, and paints will have similar tendencies because they're all sort of um, bred, w bred that way. Um, then, you know, Chris, you have the Arabians that, that have their, their special purpose. They have, they have uh, larger lungs, lung capacity because they're bred to run across deserts. So they are great for endurance riding. Um, you can use all breeds and they'll use even gated breeds for endurance. But a lot of the horses that win endurance races, which are timed events for 25, 50 or 100 miles. Um, oh. and, and one particular, the biggest one in the United States is called the Tevis Cup. And it's in the California Sierra Nevada um, area. And they have to go 100 miles in 24 hours. Wow, I'm and, no, I mean, I'm used to the Kentucky Derbies mm -hmm. and the Preakness and all of that, and mm -hmm. I, you don't hear about races like this. No, you don't, and it's not real common here in Illinois because we sort of have flat, you know, farm ground, but you can find um, like maybe a 25 or a 50 mile um, race, um, but the Tevis is, is huge, and it's beautiful country, but they, um, and they're specially trained for this. They have to be really conditioned because they're going up over mountains. They're, cr they're walking along the edge of cliffs. Um, I saw a picture of, of one horse that they snapped that was, he was literally this on, a, on a, a rock. It was on a rocky top of a mountain this steep, just, you know, digging in to right. get up um, over the mountain. And um, there are uh, sus suspension bridges that, you know, are way up over gorges that would scare most horses. They, they wouldn't cross them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's definitely endurance for, for strength and stamina, not only for the horse, but the rider as well. What about the draft horses, the, the big horses? I've been around Clydesdales uh, twice, and, and these are like 6,000 pound dogs. They're mm -hmm. just, uh, as the gentleman who raised them told me, they're just in your pocket all the time. They just, you know, they're right there, but, but they also have specific uses as well. They, they do, they use them to pull wagons or to pull any kind of a load. I mean, they can move logs and, you know, if people cut down logs, they'll hook them up and pull them out. Uh, farm equipment, anything like that. But when you think about something that big and powerful, and you see those, you know, Clydesdales are very popular because of the Clydesdale um, teams, which are very beautiful. And, the, and, and the, the Clydesdale will have the chrome, they have the white on the face and the legs that makes, makes them even stand out more. But you wouldn't want a 6,000 pound horse that was real flighty or uh, bad temperament um, because you can't control one that big. He, it'd be like almost like an elephant that got loose from the, the circus, if you will. So they are bred for that temperament um, so that they are easily handled and, and you want that. When somebody's out there considering to buy a horse, in, in your opinion, it's important to, to also do your research on what you want to do with that mm -hmm. horse. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to ride? Do you want to race? Do you want to barrel ride? Do you want, uh, so I guess that all plays into it as well. Oh, absolutely. What, what you're going to do with that horse is everything. Um, if, if you want to show that horse, are you showing it what they call it, halter, where you just um, put a halter on it, walk out in a ring and they look at the confirmation. Or are you gonna just sit on it, walk and trot? Or the gaming, which is the barrel racing, they, bear, they race around poles, they'll weave around poles, um, and they have to do it in a timed event. So do you want a fast horse or do you want one with a beautiful confirmation? Um, or it, like you said, are you, are you gonna race it? Are you gonna own a thoroughbred or a standard bred? Um, you know, anything like that, just, you have to look at the purpose. If you want just a pasture ornament, then you just get an old one, <laughs> you know, that just needs a retirement. All horses need a retirement, just like people do. Well, speaking of retirement, um, horses don't race forever. You know, they mm -hmm. race for a few years. Um, what are the uses for those horses that have been bred to, to, to run? You know, what, what are the uses for them after their time has come? Thank goodness. They used to, a lot of them just used to be put down after they, but they have horse rescues now that will take them and retrain them 
because they have a different mindset for racing and just running straight down the path as opposed to now they are really good for doing dressage and jumping. Um, they're, they're all good for that, that sort of thing. They, ha they do have potential to do other things, but they have to be retrained. What are some other maybe obscure uses for horses that maybe the average person that's not around horses every day, um, some of the things that they might be used for? Well, the first one that would come to mind would be therapy. Um, most people don't realize that, that um, like we do at Paradise Equestrian Therapy Center, we uh, take kid, um, kids with special needs and we'll put them on a horse and work with them on uh, their coordination, balance, um, uh, and um, we work with them mentally and behaviorally. Um, it's even good um, for vets. Um, that have been injured. The, the Wounded Warrior Project um, will pay scholarships for um, the, their vets who have been physically and emotionally injured um, to work with horses and you know regain um, some of their physical abilities. It's good for PTSD to spend that time with the horse. You know, again, you have that um, uh, emotional connection to a horse, and it's very calming. Um, to brush a horse. It's been shown they'll, they'll use um, horses with kids with really severe uh, behavioral or mental issues um, that will, you know, be kind of rebellious and strike out because they've been abused or whatever. They bring them in and they'll let them brush and talk to the horse. They may not talk to a person, where they, but they'll talk to a horse because the horse is, is very calming and they'll listen. Um, I had uh, I made a presentation at the um, Neoga High School a few weeks ago, and they were uh, had put out the books of War Horse, and asking the community to read it. And they wanted somebody to come in and talk about horses. And I researched the author and why he. I'm always interested in the why of things and why did he write that book and from the horse's perspective. And he had sat in a pub listening to these old guys from World War I, and one actually worked with horses during the World War I in, in England. And he talked about how horribly the um, horses were treated because they were more like machines, like a tank or a, or a Jeep or something as, a, as opposed to an animal. And so this guy decided he wanted to write this, this story, but he couldn't quite figure out how to do it. Well, in the meantime, he and his wife opened a farm to allow inner city kids from London and Birmingham to come out and spend a week at a farm, just doing farm things, you know, messing with cows and farm animals. And, and one day the teachers um, warned him about this little boy who'd come in that stuttered so badly he couldn't talk. So he said, don't ever ask him a question, it will just horrify him. And he was out one evening and went between two buildings going towards the barn and he heard somebody talking and he went around the corner and looked and it was that little boy who was holding up a lantern with a horse with his head hanging over the gate outside the barn and he was telling her all about his day and how he had been around cows and he was talking fluently to this horse and the guy said it, it wasn't the fact that the boy the little boy was talking to the horse because he knew it, that's a huge thing that, that kids will trust animals a lot of times and they can't kids. So he knew the kid would be relaxed enough to talk to the horse. What struck him was the horse was stretching out her head and her neck and looking real intently at the little boy and listening to him even though she didn't really understand what he was saying. She was giving him 100% of her attention like she was totally listening and he said that's what did it for him. And he sat down, he said, for six weeks and became a horse because he wrote the book from the horse's perspective. And mm -hmm. I encourage everyone to read that book. And, and that, of course, the movie came out just, a, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I guess. And it's a, it's, it's a little uh, gory because it's war, but it's an awesome story. What, what other uses? I, I see you light up when you talk about the therapy aspect of it because that's very close to your heart as a volunteer with the therapy center. Um, what, uh, uh, when we go into the therapy aspect of it, um, is that something that you have to, to train a horse for? Or, uh, you know, it, for all the different things that we're talking about, their versatility, is it a training or is it something that is a natural instinct for the animal? It depends. Some of them is, uh, some things are natural for them. Uh, like I said, when they'll hook on a cow or, you know, whatever, that's sort of a natural thing. And then they'll enhance the training to, uh, to get them to do that better. But most things, you can work with them 
on a daily basis and for particularly like therapy will desensitize them to a lot of different noises and people you know jumping up and down on them um, and getting around um, new things and new people uh, noise is you know sometimes a big one for a horse may not like a loud noise um, so we do work with them to make sure that they have um, the um, um, the, the knowledge base to handle kids with special needs, you know, and temperament is everything with a horse. Um, some are just have the temperament to be, um, you know, race horses or whatever, and some of them are really laid back. You know, a lot of them, um, like my Appaloosa is very laid back. He's he really is like a huge dog. I tell everybody he's probably the biggest dog you'll ever meet. Mm. You know, just he's one that's in your pocket and just mm -hmm. always, you know, has his, his head on your shoulder and. Um, he got scared at something one day and almost jumped in my arms, you know, and he, here he is, you know, weighs about 1,200 pounds, but he just was, you know, um, just scared and, and I'm his leader, so he looks to me for uh, protection and, and to um, make the, whatever is wrong right. Mm -hmm. um, but in therapy, we do prepare them to make sure that they are safe. Safety is our number one issue to make, make sure when I, we put a kid on a horse, we make it as absolutely safe as we possibly can. You cannot give 100% guarantee because horses are gonna react that you can't um, always predict. But we do try to make them as safe as they can be. Generally speaking, do horses like people? Do they want to be around people? Do they want to be ridden? Do they want to be pushed to their limit? Um, I, I would have to say that most horses do want to be around people as long as they're treated with, again, kindness and respect and they can trust you. If they trust a human, then they're going to look for you. Um, and again, and two, you know, you feed them every day. They're going to look to you for that, um, that element in their life that's a huge thing for a horse, you know, because they, they normally, out in the wild, they'll graze almost 24 hours a day, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, they they just need that trust element and they they will love people is there such a thing as the cowboy horse and and if so what exactly is the you know you read that a lot the cowboy horse what yeah. exactly is that the, it's like the quarter horse or the again the appaloosa or the paint um and there's a few other breeds where they really um, use them in cowboy events, like working out on a ranch. There's still people that have ranches that, that herd their cattle with them. Um, and then they do rodeos and, and other competitions where they, um, they have to do uh, different things like um, open gates and, oh, you know, while you're on the, you don't get off your horse when you're out, you know, you're out in the, um, the back 40, you know, because your horse might run away. So you stay on your horse to open it. Um, you, they, they rope off of them. They, you know, they rope cows and, and um, calves. Um, they, in rodeos, they'll ride them bareback. They'll put a strap under their belly that they don't like and it'll make them buck. Um, that's, that's what we typically think of as the cowboy horse. Something, anything that a cowboy will do, he does it from the back of his horse, <laughs> you know. What about the gated horse? Is that, is that another, uh, another uh, job that horses will do? Yeah, it, that is a breed, a type of breed. They can't be trained to be gated uh, so much as they have the natural ability to be gated through um, through their the, the breeding process. And there's many many different ones. There's Tennessee Walkers, there are Missouri Fox Trotters, uh, Kentucky Mountain Horses. I mean, there's a whole slew of them that I could mention. But they and they each have an, their own uh, specific way that they move. Again, that um, that it makes a smooth ride for for the rider. Um, they they were really bred a lot of them for plantation owners who would want to ride around the plantation in a day, and they can move out very quickly for long distances because they don't ex expend a lot of energy like a horse galloping, mm -hmm. like you see you know the Pony Express riders you know in sure. the old westerns. Sure. Those horses can only go so many miles, and then you're going to have to stop and get another horse. But these the gated can go really long distances at those specific gates. Um, because they're not expending a lot of energy because they move their legs in a different manner. Horses can also be used um, for entertainment purposes. You were mentioning the horse dancing. Um, yes. Is that another, you know, we've talked about farming and racing and riding and all the common uses for horses, but mm -hmm. also that's kind of an obscure uh, use for a horse as well. A lot of people will 
um, train, if, if you have the time to do it, train their, their horses to do t all kinds of tricks, you know. Um, Mr. Ed, remember him? Of you know? course I remember yeah, Mr. Look Ed. Look at all the, the talk, things that he the did. The you know? Yeah, but um, the dressage is really um, where it looks like they're dancing. They have, that is a lot of training. The lip is honors as well. You'd mentioned them before. Um, they are specially trained to do those movements and they train them over and over. You're talking years of training to get these horses to do specific movements and they can be very slow and very refined um, movements and a lot of times they'll put them to music and it makes it look like they're dancing. It's just beautiful to watch. Mm. Final story for our viewers because I know that you have a lot of them. Just mm. something that's most memorable to you about something that maybe um, a horse and what they have done uh, either in your life or, or somebody that you've been yeah, close to. Mm. I have many stories we could go on forever, but um, since this is the Paul report, I'll stick to the to the, the human, <laughs> the, the, horse, or the animal element of it. But but I I would like to point out that one of the things that I uh, realized about horse therapy and um, is that it's not just about the rider who gains so many benefits from not just riding but spending time with the horse. It's about the family because the families receive joy from watching those kids ride those horses because they may not be able to, to kick a soccer ball or hit a home run, but they can ride a horse. And the parents get to cheer them on and, and spend time with them uh, doing an activity that, that they can't normally do. So that's a great thing to see is the parents receive great joy from that as, as well as the rider's benefits. Um, but the one particular story that I had uh, told you earlier was um, we do day camps uh, for Life Links and Helping Hands out of Sullivan. And um, this last year we did one for the special ed classes out of Mattoon. And the first day they brought the, the kids who were lower functioning and some of them were in wheelchairs. So I took my ponies because um, so, it's easier for them to be able to pet them and spend time with them and brush them or whatever. And I took um, my bigger pony, Belle, out of the, the pen and I walked her over. I didn't have her on a tight um, rope because she's so good. And she walked specifically up to one little boy in a wheelchair and he had a tray across and his hands were curled, uh, showing you his, you know, his disability. He was nonverbal. Um, but he had, he was just cute as he could be. He looked like he was about 10 or 11 and he had sandy blonde hair and he had big freckles across his nose. She walked right up to him and just um, started just nuzzling his face around and around. And, and they'll do that, they'll nuzzle, but they, not like that. I've never seen her do that, just around and around her face. And he, he kind of held his face up and he closed his eyes and he just grinned really big like he was looking at the sun. and. And they just, I called it a love fest between the two of them. And he, he picked his little hand up and he kind of, he, he petted her neck and, they, and he just smiled really big. And then before they left, I invited them to come into the pen with, the, with the, both ponies. And I noticed that my other pony did the exact same thing. She just loved all over him and he just smiled. And, and I really looked at it, really noticed what was going on because it was kind of unusual. And I said to his mother, I said, I think they recognize a kindred spirit. And she said, you're right, because she said all animals uh, do that with him. They will just gravitate to him and they just have this little love fest. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, yeah, I looked at him and he was just as, uh, I think, as pure and innocent as the day he was born. And I said, I, think, I, I got cold chills because I think I just saw an angel on earth. Oh. It was just the sweetest thing I ever saw. Well, of all the special things that uh these big animals can do. I think the human connection is probably um, the most special. Yes. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and, and knowledge with us today on horses uh, on this episode of the Paw Report. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for asking. In this Paw Report Extra, Car enthusiasts love to hear the purr of a finely tuned engine, but when they hear meowing under the hood, there's obviously a problem. Roger Weeder has the story of a kitten rescued from an unlikely place. No room to work under the hood had Rusty Newton working the jacks. White's Automotive responded to the call, an emergency. First jacking up one side, then the other. Finally enough room, Newton slid under the car. See it? There he is.
What he saw and found was a kitten. I knew you were black. Angie Fox was persistent. When she heard the kitten purring, her thoughts turned to getting it rescued. So I couldn't leave with an animal in a vehicle. And so then we realized it was in the engine bay. The jacking was the hard part. The rescue did not take long. It ended with everyone being happy and the kitten being named. We'll name it boy or girl, we'll name it Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> Say thank you. So Rusty, where was it hiding? In between the exhaust manifold and the firewall. Just had to reach up over the rack and pinion and pull him out. Production for the Paul Report is made possible by Inyert Tire and Auto Center in Charleston and Mattoon. Inyert offers complete auto repair. Inyert Tire and Auto Center cares about our community and thanks you for being a responsible pet owner. More information at Inyert.com.